this week we have uh, Jamie Radabaugh, and she's a professor at BYU, just down the road. Uh, Jamie did her BS at BYU in 1993 in physics and astronomy. She then went on to get a geology master's degree, and then she did her PhD work at uh, the University of Arizona, and specifically the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory in uh, 2005 and she was postdoc at U of A also for a year or two. And at 2006, she joined the faculty at BYU. Um, so she uh, works a lot on, she says she travels the world looking for analogs to solar system landscapes. So that's, I think we're gonna hear a little bit about that today. Um, uh, on the human side, she's a regular science expert on how the universe works, and that's on the Science Channel. Uh, I'm not sure if that's available on Hulu or Netflix or Hulu. maybe both. <laughs> um, and from a, a personal standpoint, I've been in the field a couple times with Janie in Antarctica, and it doesn't list this on here, but she is the person you want when you're too shy to approach NSF <laughs> and have to say, why aren't we in the field after three weeks of delay? So, Get us um, in the field. <laughs> she's a great scientist and a great advocate for uh, science. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, everybody hear me okay? Um, I'll, I'll uh, enunciate uh, as my grandmother taught me. Um, so yeah, I want to talk to you about some of the field studies that we're doing, but in the framework of solar system exploration. And the way we do that is through spacecraft. And so um, this is, is mainly about two missions. One is the Cassini mission to Saturn uh, that uh, ended in just 2017, and then also the Dragonfly mission. Um, and how many have heard about Dragonfly yet? Okay, so uh, this, is a, this is a really fun idea. One day, a friend of mine came to me and he said, hey, I've, he called me up in my office um, at BYU. He was a friend from the University of Arizona. And he said, I've got this idea for uh, Saturn's mission. And we'll get to Titan and why it's so interesting and why this is such a good idea. But he said, you know, I've got this mission idea. I want to um, send a spacecraft there and he told me all the details and while he was telling me I just kind of got chills I was like this is so exciting this is really brave I don't know if NASA will go for it it's so brave but it's really cool I like the idea and then you know flash forward a couple years and we we ended up rolling and bouncing along in, in, in some land cruisers in Morocco and um, talking over the details of this mission the names of the instruments and what kind of instruments we'd need and all kinds of stuff and and just with my my friends my colleagues and then Somehow, we made it through all the hoops and ended up being the next billion dollar mission that NASA chose to go to Saturn's moon Titan. And um, so just kind of in a, this is sort of the, the punchline, I guess, this is exactly what the mission will do. It will go directly to this moon of Saturn. It will, it will go down into the atmosphere and then fire up its rotors. It's a, it's a drone that will fly across the surface of uh, through the atmosphere of Titan and across the landscape. You can see some kind of Earth-like landscapes here, um, some rivers and lakes and mountains, and it will land, and, um, and it's about as tall as I am. So it's kind of interesting to think of that. It will open up an antenna and talk directly to Earth. It will drill into the surface and pull up materials into an onboard mass spectrometer. It will tell us what those materials are made of and pick itself up and fly again to another location 50 kilometers away. Uh, and this is our mission idea, and it's so exciting. And it's, um, we, can, we can live there for three years. We have a radioactive battery and uh, fly to dozens of different locations and, and take samples at these locations. So it's a whole new idea for how to do a, a, a mission to another planet. It's beyond the rovers, it's um, closer than the orbiters, and so we're really excited. It's, it's gonna be great. Um, so we're in the stage of it over the next five years, um, and, and we'll go, uh, we'll launch in, in about five years. And here's the mission team. This was our first meeting last September, where we all just kind of got together with our, our eyes like big like saucers, like, did this really happen? <laughs> or do we really have a mission? And, um, and, you know, we all look, I don't know, fairly young here, and, and by the time the mission gets there in 2034, <laughs> we're not going to look like this anymore. <laughs> So I always wonder, why are the, all these mission teams so old? Well, because I work on the outer solar system and it takes eight years to fly to Saturn. So <laughs> it's gonna be a while. Um, and you'll see uh, one of these um, people in here, you can maybe pick her out, her, her name is Elizabeth Turtle. 
and she's the principal investigator. She's at uh, Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. It's kind of like a NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory of the East. And they sent the Pluto mission and a couple others. And she's been a really good friend and mentor to me ever since graduate school at Arizona. She was a grad student there uh, when I was. And then uh, Jason, whose idea it was, was a grad student at Arizona. My postdoc advisor in the back is Ralph Lorenz, who's Zibby's husband and was at University of Arizona. There's a theme here, and that is all of these relationships I built, built in graduate school have really stayed with me throughout my whole career, and they've become some of the most important relationships I've had. So um, work hard on those and get to know each other because you'll see each other forever. So that's, that's been really good, <laughs> whether you want to or not, right? <laughs> okay, well, um, so just a little bit about Titan. Um, this is a picture of Titan taken by the Cassini orbiter, and that's actually a glint off of the, um, off of the pole region, and there's liquid at the surface of Titan. Um, there's no other place in the solar system besides Earth where there's actually liquid, wa liquid sitting on the surface. In this case, it's liquid methane. It's so far away that it's so cold that methane is a liquid on the surface. And so it's kind of like what you see in an airplane when you fly past a lake and it kind of glints at your, at your eyes. Um, basically, we don't know how life um, came to Earth and we can't go back and study our own history. And um, there are places elsewhere in the solar system that might provide pieces to this puzzle of the chemical processes that led to life. Right now, all of the kind of um, macrofauna and the success stories are overwhelming any of those early kind of uh, signatures that had to sort of eke their way through survival. And so there might be those things that exist uh, somewhere else in the solar system. And maybe even just the sort of uh, elsewhere in the solar system. Titan is a place that um, is most like the early Earth, we think, in the sense that there is a sort of a prebiotic chemistry soup sitting right on the surface. It's easy to access. We can just fly right to these locations that we think might hold the, the pieces to these puzzles. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as, as we go on. Saturn is the largest, or Titan is the largest of Saturn's 62 moons. All of these are shown to scale. And they're also in the right um, order in terms of Saturn. So the smallest out to, kind of out to biggest out here, which is um, interesting, probably not coincidental. Saturn's not down here, it's actually over here <laughs> in this picture, but it kind of shows you their, their sizes by comparison. And look how different Titan is from all the others. All these bodies are 50% rock and metal, 50% water ice. They're at a region in the solar system where ice was abundant. Um, ice was able to, water was able to condense starting at Jupiter and everything from there on out uh, is very rich in water ice. So you kind of have infinite water available. So, um, so these bodies grew grew pretty big and especially Titan grew very large and you can see it has a thick atmosphere. And in fact, um, this atmosphere was suggested pretty early on and, um, and then was observed, the nitrogen in the atmosphere was observed and later some methane was observed um, in, the, in the 40s. And so this nitrogen rich atmosphere, that sounds familiar, right? It's just like our own planet Earth. Um, there are a lot of other kind of Earth-like things about Titan that we'll talk about here. Um, not only is it unique among its own other sibling satellites at Saturn, but among the other satellites in the solar system. There are some similarities here. You can see the size is similar to the two biggest ones of Jupiter, Ganymede and Callisto. Um, it's the only one with an atmosphere. None of these other moons have atmospheres that are significant. Notice here we've got the moon and there's this other one here, Io. Um, and I want to talk about Io for just a second. Um, Io is, like, unlike these others, Ganymede, Callisto, Europa, Triton, Titan, all are half ice, half rock and metal. Our moon and Io are both silicate worlds. And um, Io, in fact, is a really interesting body because there are hundreds of active volcanoes right now all across the surface. And we see evidence of that from telescopes and from other spacecraft. Each of these black dots you see is an active volcano because it's not active, it cools off and then gets covered by sulfur and sulfur dioxide frosts that are continually emitted from the volcanoes. And that's all the yellow kind of coverings that you see all over the surface. The reds are elemental sulfur that's being spewed out right now because we think within hours that changes to yellow or orange. And so you can see the kind of scale of activity. And also, I mean, do you really see signs of like a global tectonic system here? It's kind of just that everything is relatively randomly scattered across the body. And so just last week, there was a, 
a decision made that four missions out of 20 that were submitted for the discovery call, this is half the budget of uh, Dragonfly, so $500 million, would move forward for study in the coming year. And then at the end of that, you know, they have to run this gauntlet of engineering mostly and prove that they could do what they said they could do. And they will choose as many as two out of those four that were down selected. And one of them is this mission to IO. Um, so, and, and I'm on that team and we're pretty excited to kind of think about this idea of like, oh gosh, we could go back to IO. We could look at the active volcanism, but also think about IO as a tidally heated world. What happens when you superheat a body? And might that tell us a little bit about the early earth? Um, and also about exoplanets that might be orbiting really close to their stars. I just presented a poster where I said, Io is an extreme, you know, exo world analog. And all the astronomers were like, that's, that's not extreme. <laughs> like we have, we have a completely molten body orbiting a star. Like, okay, well, whatever. So, um, <laughs> so we'll do our best. But uh, we think there are signs that there is a magnitude in Io. So here's a, an artist rendition. Um, this is by, I didn't put a good, uh, reference up here, but it's by James Tuttle Keen, and he's a planetary scientist who's also a sketch artist for Nature Geoscience. Sometimes you see those sketch-ups. Um, this is him. You can follow him. Um, anyway, you could ask me how to get a hold of him on Twitter, but he made this, this diagram. He's also on this IO mission team, and it shows a couple of scenarios for the interior of IO, and we're trying to kind of figure out which of these is true. Is it an um, actual magma ocean? Right here, is it a magma sponge? These are actual, you know, terms for what we think are going on inside Io. And, um, you know, in what way is this tidal heat released on Io right now? And can, could we relate that to what's going on on, on earlier, especially? Okay. And, and so then, and I don't have too much time on this, but we do try to go to lava lakes all around the planet because we think that's how the heat is being released on Io is mostly in lakes of lava. And there's really just a handful of lava lakes, it turns out, in the world and they're in difficult places. Um, there was, there's in, one in Ethiopia, there's one in Antarctica. Um, I don't know which is harder to get to because <laughs> NSF you know, keeps you from going to the one in Antarctica. The hardest one to get to in the world was in Kilauea <laughs> because of the rules and regulations that we place on, on everything. I could not get to that lava lake no matter how hard I tried and now it's gone. So anyway, um, <laughs> so uh, we're trying to go to those places and try to see, you know, could we bring instruments that would remind us of being in a spacecraft and what would we see at that lava lake that we could learn about. Okay, back to Titan. Um, so since Titan has an atmosphere, we might start also comparing it to Venus or Earth. And uh, it turns out that it's, it's the second highest surface pressure of all solid bodies. So it's actually got a higher surface pressure than Earth's. It's one and a half bars and um, four times the density. And this is just because Io's, or Titan is a small body and the atmospheres are extended, and so that means that it's got a, more, a greater density at the surface. So if you start thinking about that, it's a high uh, pressure, high density, it's a cold atmosphere, it's very good for flying, right? Um, perfect in many ways for, for flying. So we've been thinking about that for a long time. <clears throat> and we have explored Titan a couple of times. This is a Voyager image of Titan uh, taken in 1981. And this, this actually is really what sparked our interest. Like, oh, hey, look at this uh, atmosphere. It's nitrogen, but also we can't see the surface because it's covered in a smog, a lot like what we have out here right now, almost the same composition, a hydrocarbon smog. And this is because the methane goes up into the upper atmosphere, it breaks apart, and it recombines into long chain organics. We've seen things like benzene and propane and acetylene and maybe longer chain organics, but we just didn't have the right instruments with Cassini to be able to distinguish what those were. And they fill up the atmosphere with a haze that's constantly there. And so there are plenty of organics there, uh, just not made by life, but um, made inorganically and that, that um, are, have access to the surface at, at all times. So uh, part of the reason for the Cassini mission was to be able to send a probe to orbit Saturn and study Saturn in detail but also to send a, a probe that would descend down through the atmosphere of Titan and land on the surface. And that's the Huygens probe, and this is a European contribution to this joint uh, NASA and ESA mission. And notice how big this is. I mean, it's like the size of a bus. It's got like 13 instruments on it, and uh, is, is a flagship mission um, that costs NASA, you know, more like three or four billion dollars. And um, it actually launched in 1997 and it arrived at Saturn in 2004. So again, with this kind of you know, seven or eight year cruise time. 
Uh, and it, it worked at Saturn from 2004 until 2017. And here you can see all the orbits um, around Saturn and it had to orbit Saturn, but it flew past Titan and a bunch of the other moons while it was there. And it really led to a lot of just uh, amazing pictures. I'm sure you've all seen pictures from Cassini of the Saturn system. Um, it had, in my opinion, the way the camera was designed was just a really beautiful kind of soft texture to the images. And here you see a, an atmosphere quite different from Jupiter's, which has really got these big uh, bands and storms and all kinds of things. But Saturn's is just more calm, um, soft in nature, except for that really hard, the hard lines that the, the rings take. Um, I think this is a really beautiful picture and it's enhanced um, so it wouldn't be quite like this to your eye but it reminds you that it's taken from a spacecraft and can you think about why that's true it's just that where's the sun here the sun is behind us and so we're on the other side of Saturn and looking back through Saturn to the sun and Saturn is 10 times as far away from the sun as the earth and so this, we've gone a, a great distance to get here and um, notice that the light is bent through the atmosphere, so that reminds us there's an atmosphere here. And this tiny little dot right here um, that you can see through the rings, if we zoom into that dot, it's actually the Earth and the Moon we see through that. So it gives us a real sense of just how far away and how big everything is, right? Um, there are a number of other really kind of amazing things here. This is a quick video that sh is, is the rings, and we're kind of going down past the ring plane. So in a minute you'll be able to see just how thin the ring plane is. And I think a couple of shepherd moons will zoom in here in just a second. Um, yeah, there's one right there. So now watch closely. Boom. Just blade thin. Isn't that amazing? It's um, just a couple hundred meters thick and a hundred thousand kilometers wide and made up of ice particles, all water ice uh, from tiny dust all the way up to the size of a house. And they're all formed in these discrete rings and held there by shepherd moons. And you can't always see the shepherd moons in here, but those are the ones kind of in charge of each of those clumps and gaps and things like that inside the rings. We got some close-ups of the rings during the last stages of, of the mission. We actually flew really close to Saturn and took a careful look at the rings. And, and notice how many kind of wavelengths you see here in this picture. There's a number of different things here. And this is all a result of the, the orbit of the rings and then also um, gravitational perturbations inside Saturn that are transmitted to the rings. And so there's a whole new field of uh, sort of like planetary seismology on the gas giants that people are talking about that you can actually orbit a spacecraft and listen to the sort of waves that are coming out of the body to help you understand the interior of the planet. So that's kind of starting to emerge. This one here, Mimas, it's just 500 kilometers across and is, notice it's just had a lot of cratering in its history. Again, it's mostly a water ice crust. It's got this one big crater. What does it remind us of? <coughs> Death Star. <laughs> this is our Death Star moon, right? <laughs> um, I mean, this crater was, if it, if it had been any bigger, it might have split this body apart, right? It, it's uh, really pretty big. Um, if we go out from Mimas, we get to Enceladus and here we're looking at this the E ring, that kind of really hazy ring that you could see on the outside of, of all the rings. And Enceladus is this tiny black dot embedded in those rings. So we knew for a long time that Enceladus was sitting inside of the ring, this E ring, and probably contributing to it in some way or just had, had something to do with it. But it's really tiny. There's no way there's anything happening. Um, but one of the kind of, it's, it's actually a plasma wave or magnetometer expert convinced the mission there. She's like, I really think there's something going on at Enceladus based on my, based on these squiggly lines. Will you alter all your orbits and fly past Enceladus? And she's like, they're going to say no, there's no way. And they said, yeah, okay, we'll do that. So they did, they flew past Enceladus and found, oh, first of all, it's the same size as Mimas, but a very different surface now, isn't it? Uh, much younger um, in the sense that there are no impact craters over here. This is all just heavily tectonized. And again, just a water ice crust. And you can see these cracks here and there it's enhanced color. So you can see the blue, which is um, crystalline water ice. So pretty recently crystallized. And not only that, we found that there is water gushing out of those cracks, gushing out of the South Pole and spewing water kind of actually mixed with silicates because deep down inside that body, uh, the water, um, there must be water in contact with silicate rock. And so it's like this free sample 
of the interior of Enceladus being spewed out to space. So there's real interest from NASA in trying to go and collect some samples here. And that's because, oh, there's water coming out. Now you can see how they're clearly coming out of those cracks, little tiny fountains pouring out. And, um, and so we know there's liquid water down there and it's part of a family called Ocean Worlds. And these are all of great interest to NASA because there's water, there's liquid water, in some cases in contact with rock and nutrients. And so maybe we look here for evidence of life. We've been thinking about Mars for so long and we still do, but maybe we could also look in these other places and see if life could have gotten started there. And sometimes my friends um, take my pictures and put me on, on other planets. <laughs> this is uh, artist Mike Carroll. Um, this is a picture I took in Antarctica. And you can really imagine this, just walking around on a nice surface of Enceladus. But um, Antarctica is one of the greatest um, miracles of my life, that I get to go to this, this place, and all I have to do is wait in McMurdo for a month <laughs> and um, go plop my tent down and then walk you know, 50 yards out to chip out some ice for water, and I find a meteorite just sitting right there, a little rock that has fallen from outer space. And uh, we know this so well now, uh, this program that Jim is, is leading, that we can choose these places in Antarctica and pitch our tents and find hundreds of meteorites over the course of just a few weeks. It's, like, it's a guarantee. And, um, and it's amazing. It's, it's you know, a big box full of basically free samples from outer space. And we're willing to pay a lot of money to go get samples from outer space, right? And so uh, this, is, this is really just such a, an amazing thing. It's a lot of work. Can you find Jim in there? Um, here we are kind of getting all of, our, all of our things together. This is our mountaineer, Johnny. He's been doing this for a long time. He's now 70. And he's found more meteorites than anyone on Earth by a long shot, um, thousands, tens of thousands of meteorites. Ten? I don't know. Ten, fifteen. And, um, and so, you know, we have to go prepare to go be out in the field in tents and live there for six weeks. And that's the greatest thing. I love it. You know, a lot of people find it hard, but I think it's great. Um, there's also a little bit of work that you have to do. We got to put all of our gear on aircraft and fly them out to the field. And um, this includes putting a snowmobile on a, an airplane. They asked me once if I'd drive it up here. I was like, uh, I, do you really want me to do that? <laughs> uh, because you don't want to go out the other side, right? <laughs> <laughs> we only had to do this eight times, one for every snowmobile, and um, it's actually a little, a little easier to get it out. You just kind of push it out the back, which is, which is good. Um, so there, a lot of this is, is work, and it's, it's a challenge, um, and there's logistics involved, and basically we drive our snowmobile up, you know, across the landscape, we find these meteorites, and we document where we took them. Here's some GPS that we're taking of the locations of them. And, try to understand where they're concentrated and, and what's going on to bring them there. And, um, and uh, we get to see these really beautiful landscapes. Here's uh, one of my favorite campsites at the Miller Range, looking out at these gorgeous mountains. And, um, you know, and the fact that you can just go out and pick up this piece here, which is an iron meteorite. So this is a part of a core of a planetary body that used to exist. It was big enough to differentiate into core and mantle and crust. And since then has been broken up and uh, bits of it have landed on Earth. And because of all these meteorites we're collecting in Antarctica, we're starting to realize things like there are over a hundred different parent bodies of these iron meteorites, which we just thought, oh, was, was it just one or two of these bodies that broke up? No, the isotopic ratios are different enough that it took a hundred of them to do this. And that gives us a sense of the early solar system and what kinds of things were going on. And occasionally we find really special ones, like this one I remember picking up and we just, we just were dazzled. We're like, oh, look at this. It's a, it's a plagioclase feldspar with some olivines in there and there's some breccia on the outside. And it looks like basalt for sure. For sure this is from the moon. We can't wait till they tell us it's from the moon. And it's not from the moon and it's not from Mars and it's not from Vesta. So we don't know wh where is this thing from? Where is this from? There's still some very big mysteries out there in the solar system. And collecting these, we um, can keep building that library and understanding this better. Um, and it's really fun. We make good, strong friendships here, so. <laughs> yeah. What's the meteorite process, the recovery process? Do they plant themselves 30 feet deep and then the ice has to go down to where they are? Or how does it look? 
um, it appears that they, they just kind of fall evenly all over the whole ice sheet and then uh, the glacier processes take over so that glacier flows out toward the edges of the continent and in many cases just drops off out into the ocean. But if it runs into the mountain range that goes right down through Antarctica, then, then the ice there just kind of starts to rise up to the surface and, and especially the stuff down deep that got compacted rises up and, and then ablates away and it just has c carried everything there like a conveyor belt that was sitting on there. So some may just sit on the surface, some may have been buried deeply and they all end up in these, um, these areas by the mountains. I think that's right. Now I've got someone who knows about this more <laughs> carefully right here. Okay. And we get kind of grisly by the end of it. I even probably have a beard in this one. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, so back to the Cassini mission and we've just dropped the probe down through the atmosphere of Titan and, um, and we thought, oh, we'll splash down in these seas of methane because, you know, the atmosphere, we could tell from telescopes, atmosphere saturated in methane. We should splash down in an ocean of methane. But instead it landed on a solid surface. And you can see kind of um, the panel in the middle there is what we actually saw. I'll show a close up of that in a minute. And then it's for kind of like what you would see is a, a Apollo picture on the right. That's the point of view. And we actually, um, we had a, a celebration last, uh, last fall in Madrid with all the Europeans and everybody and made a cake. This is a Huygens cake. These are the crazy things you do in, in science, right? You've got to celebrate every minute that you can. Um, I'll just show you a quick little video of the descent. These are actual pictures. This affords us a good view of the drainage channels and upper shoreline. More dark lowlands appear and a rough pitted hillside to the left. Spectra of the surface suggests that the bright areas are water ice, and the darker areas are a type of hydrocarbon mixture that has never been produced in the laboratory. The small white dot in the lower center part of sea tracks our progress over the surface. We see the reverse on the direction at seven kilometers altitude fly over the ridge near where we went. As we approach the surface, our perspective brings the topography to black. We see that although there are rivers and a shoreline, the basin is dry. Below, there are distinct signs of erosion which crafted the rugged ridge line. Quaidens sinks into one of these gullies. We experience a relatively soft landing on Titan's surface. The view from the surface reveals an amazingly Earth-like picture of a dry riverbed with distant hills which were a few meters in height. Some seconds after impact, the shadow of Poitin's parachute drifts across the sea. The heat from the surface science lamp and the probe's skin vaporizes methane from Titan's surface, which is about 180 centigrade degrees below freezing. Near the probe, the ground is littered with water ice rocks and smaller patterns, which could be made of water ice or hydrocarbons or some combination thereof. Let me just skip to this. Um, isn't that amazing just how... But you heard this idea that the cobbles are either water, ice, or organics. So there's no silicates on the surface of Titan. They're all buried deep down in the interior. And this crust is made of water, ice. But we see a pervasive signature from orbit of organics. I'll show you that in a minute. Not not a strong signature of water ice except in a few places. So how do you get organic pebbles? This is a whole kind of thing that we haven't even thought about. How do you get maybe layers of organic sedimentary rock and then erode that into pebbles and cobbles and sand and dust of different sizes of organics? It's just a whole area that we don't understand and yet it looks a lot like Earth. And this, this um, really evolved river channel is something we saw as we were descending with the Huygens probe and so there's this kind of theme that I'm working with is that um, you know the materials are different but the processes and the landforms are the same and so we, we use Earth's landscapes that we can come up to and touch and study much more up close to better understand what's going on on other planets and vice versa we see the kind of extreme conditions on other planets and might be able to come and apply those to Earth. So just a few kind of global images of Titan that we can see here this is a more or less visible camera but through a window that we could peer through that thick haze in the atmosphere and notice there is a you know clear kind of bright and dark terrains all across the equator all of these dark materials here are sands it turns out these are all sands but they're dark in color uh, maybe a kind of black to brownish color if we look at this in 
uh, a little bit farther in the infrared, this is, this is an infrared camera to show composition. The browns and the oranges are all organics in composition, and the blues, the light blues are water, and the dark blues are water ice. And so there is some water ice exposed, especially around this kind of round feature here, which you might guess is probably an impact crater, right? So the impact crater would expose that buried deep kind of basement, the crystalline basement, which is water ice here. And then the sedimentary layers on top of it um, are, are the organics we think of. There's one last data set, and this is crazy, but it's all the same area. This is uh, the radar data. So we actually used a radar to penetrate through the atmosphere and see to the surface, and that was built up in strips as we did close flybys of Titan. There's something like um, 50 or so of these here. And so um, I'll talk a bit about the radar. That's mostly what I worked with, or radar data. Um, we can see in these radar pictures, it's, you, have to, you can think of these, if you're not used to looking at radar, as kind of like a flash photograph. Um, uh, and, and the brights and the darks mean a little bit different. Dark means smooth and bright means rough, but also you can look at mountain peaks and things like that with the bright. Um, and you, so you can see here, oh, this is, this is a lake. Like clearly it's a lake, right? And it's dark because it's a liquid, and so that's the signal bounces off of it because it's so flat. Um, then there are some kind of mountainous ridges over here, um, some canyons and rugged terrains, and then also some, some rough uh, bottoms of some river channels here. These must be dry because they are not dark. They're not filled with liquid like this one, so this is sort of like a, an ephemeral desert stream in this case. These lakes and seas are up at the North Polar region of Titan, and they're very big. Um, this one we would call a sea. It's called Lygia Mare. Um, I believe it's something like, oh, I'm going I'm to get this wrong, and I don't have a scale bar. apologize. I think it's something like 150 kilometers across, but I think I'm underestimating in this case. Um, but notice how there's kind of drowned morphologies here. So it, to me, it looks like there are some portions that look like well, these might have been more full at some point in the past, but there are other, other areas that look like this, this is drowned and uh, used to be less full in the past. So I feel like it's a, an intermediate state if that's possible. And um, maybe seasonally they change. We tried to watch as long as we could over a Titan season, but Titan's year is 21 years long, so we didn't have enough time. We got kind of halfway through the year and that's it. And we didn't see any significant changes over that time period. Um, as I mentioned before, the whole equator of Titan is covered in dark sand, and actually most of it is organized into sand dunes. And these are a different kind of dune than we're used to in the western U.S. Most of our dunes collect in, um, in tectonic valleys, and they're trans transverse or barken in nature. But this kind of dune is a linear dune, and, or longitudinal, and we find those in the big deserts, in Arabia, in, um, in Egypt and Libya, in Australia. Namibia. This is where the dunes can really grow and um, just kind of keep moving and growing and growing larger over time. And almost the entire equatorial region of Titan, so something like 20% of the body is covered in sand dunes. Uh, in this case, they're dark to radar because the particles are fine. So if you saw a radar image of, of um, Egypt, it would look the same. The sand dunes would be dark. But they're also dark in, in color, in actual color. So. Um, and what is the composition? Again, it's organics. It's not, it's not eroded water ice. We were just so puzzled by this. It's organics. And how do we make this? Do we make these organic sedimentary layers and then erode the layers and make the sands? It seems like maybe that's the best way to do it. And, and you end up with a handful of, I keep trying to figure out an analog. Is it you know, grape nuts? Is it coffee grounds? Is it, you know, what is it? Uh, in composition and color, it's about like that, right? So. Um, this is what I just really want, is that handful of sand. There are some impact craters. Here's an example of a really big one. Can you see that outer ring and then this inner um, peak ring on the center of this crater? It's heavily eroded. It looks a lot like an Earth impact crater because we know there's methane rainfall that occurs on Titan. And you see the river channels cutting through that here. And then the sand dunes encroaching on it. And so um, where we will go with Dragonfly is to an area where there was an impact crater and then there's some sand dunes nearby. So you have mixing of organics and liquid water for at least a little while because of the energy of that impact event. And it would be just the perfect kind of soup that we're looking for of, of prebiotic conditions, okay? We do have evidence of, of tectonism on Titan. See our scale bar here? These are some very long tectonic ridges. And it's unusual because on Titan, we think that these are actually contractional. 
based on their kind of wavelength and sinuosity here. And um, it's kind of unusual for an icy body. Um, but we think that we have this ground methane. That's interesting to think of it that way, right? Ground methane that exists that helps to lubricate these faults and enable this contractional tectonism. And that's maybe unique to Titan on icy bodies. Does anybody want to guess at the naming scheme for these mountains? Maybe we give you one more hint here. They're actually from the Lord of the Rings. We got permission to name the mountains after the Lord of the Rings. So it's really awesome. Um, and this one here is the uh, tallest mountain on Titan. It's 3,000 meters. It's not really that high, right, compared to our giant Olympus Mons and our big, you know, 30,000 foot high mountain here on Earth. The, the uh, topography is very subdued because eventually water ice reaches a point where it, it really does heat up too much and it can't support high topography. So it's different from silicates in that way and we just have an overall low topography. There's one feature that we think might be a volcano. So if you start thinking about making a volcano in a water ice crust, then, then the crustal material you're melting is water. So this is water running across the surface, but is a volcano, right? And that's a strange way to think of it. But this feature here, we have a hard time thinking of what else it could be um, because it's got a big direction. There's some flow-like features around it. So we think that's a good possibility that it's a cryovolcano. And we got to call it Mount Doom, which is also really cool. Okay, river channels. I'm gonna kind of skip. I've got a lot of things to go to here. Um, but just to kind of help us think about this, it, there is this water ice shell. This is what we think the structure of Titan is like. A liquid water ocean. And this is at about 50 kilometers depth. So this functions a lot like an asthenosphere. So we think Titan's crust could be kind of mobile over this liquid water ocean. And then a high pressure water layer uh, that's solid. And then this kind of hydrated silicate interior. And, um, but we, you know, we want to get a better sense of what's going on in, inside of here. Um, and it's, again, pretty big. Look how big it is compared to the moon, um, the Earth's moon. But it has a similar gravity to, to the Earth's moon because there's so much water ice. Okay, so there's lower, less mass inside. Um, again, the, with the surface pressure, and then we have a temperature. I don't know if I ever said this, but it's 94 Kelvin. <laughs> so everything is very cold. Um, you can imagine, actually, it would be kind of easy to explore there as a human because your spacesuit doesn't have to be a big, bulky pressure suit but uh, you have to have everything covered. Like it's gotta be the warmest winter coat, you know, Antarctic coat, you can imagine. Um, here's a, a globe that shows the, the, you know, infrared image here. And so I just wanna talk a bit about our dunes work. Here are all the dunes, they're in brown, right here in this, in this kind of picture. And so you can see there are a lot of them. There are some kind of continental materials that poke up above here and they preclude the movement of the dunes around the body. Uh, much like what happens on Earth. So here are some dunes in Libya, and you can see these mountain blocks poking up and kind of stopping the movement of the dunes, and they have to kind of divert around the obstacle. Notice too, like, as you, as you look at this, the, the motion of the wind and the, the movement of the sand is down the dune long axis rather than transverse to it like we're used to. So the wind is, the transport is generally down, down the axis, and, and um, you can see some of it streaming off the top of those mountains. And so because of our understanding of dunes on the Earth, we can apply that to Titan and get a sense of which way the winds are blowing on Titan. And here this one is coming and bumping up into a kind of a bright obstacle. Notice too the image resolution we have to work with. Like we're not, we're not Mars, we're so, <laughs> I always look at these pictures of Mars, I'm like, why? <laughs> why can't I have that? Um, we've, we've gone to a number of places. This is the Namib Sand Sea. Um, a lot of these places I wasn't aware of until I started studying um, sand dunes and Aeolian geomorphology, but notice how there's a whole bunch of sand confined, first of all, by a river channel up in the north and then by some highlands to the east and by the ocean to the west. And it's just built up into these very large sand dunes. And in fact, they're so big that uh, basically it took us half the day to bring our GPR, ground penetrating radar, up and, uh, up and over this dune. And here we're using a, a 200 megahertz GPR. And um, yeah, this is, I mostly make the students do this, but <laughs> sometimes I get to. Um, but this was a really good place to do some ground penetrating radar work because we could go as deep as, sorry, I don't have a scale on here, but this is about 10 meters deep. And you can see a lot of really interesting stratigraphy in here, right? Some trough cross stratification, some truncations and other things like that. And we've started to build up a picture that indicates that, that confirms that the sand transport is indeed down the, the, the long axis of the dune, okay? And so, surface um, helps us understand that and, uh, and also we see some 
reverse patterns that tell us that seasonally or even maybe over longer time scales, um, the dominant kind of wind patterns on one side or the, or the other of the dune change and that helps to kind of shepherd the dune and move it, um, in this case, toward the north. And so using that information that, hey, the sands are kind of being transported down the long axis, we can build up a map of um, which way the wind is blowing in general or which way the sand is being transported all across the surface of Titan. And so that's this right here. And so in general, the sand transport is from the west to the east. And for a long time, this was at odds with the atmospheric models. And I even, it's interesting all these arguments you get, and I even had the atmospheric modeler say, are you sure your images are turned up the right, the right side, <laughs> the right side up? Yes, I'm sure my images are turned the right side up. So we, because it was exactly the opposite. Why is this happening? And then we realized, well, during times of storms or the season changes, there are very fast westerlies right at the surface. Um, and so the wind direction is exactly right during um, just certain times of the year. And that could be enough to transport the sand and continue to move these dunes. <coughs> just a couple more things. We're doing some other things. There's statistical work my students are doing. And so they've measured out width and spacing of these dunes um, in certain areas. This is a lot of painstaking work. And you say, why don't you automate it? It turns out to be kind of hard to automate it, in, especially with those low resolution images I have. So I feel like having the students do it as a, you taking an artistic eye at measuring the width of And then we're working with somebody in statistics to understand that, you know, if you, if you eyeball this, you can see, you know, the dunes in these kind of pink areas are kind of have a pattern more like each other in the individual dune rather than across the dune, right? Um, and, and there are bigger differences as you go away from rather than just going down the dune in terms of the width in, in this case. So maybe sand transport along a dune is more important and integrated than transport across dunes. These are just some kind of pictures that are emerging for us as we look more carefully at the sand dunes. Okay, just have one more analog to focus on here. Um, some other trains we've been looking at on Titan, look how straight these lines are in here. And first you have to ask yourself, is this real? Is this just a rare artifact? And no, in fact, it's real and they are that straight. Those are much straighter than the sand dunes we looked at, aren't they? Like really straight. We thought, well, these actually look a lot like some other very straight features that we see on Mars. And these are called yardangs. And the yardang is a wind carved ridge. And we have a lot of them on Mars because Mars has been under the, the influence of wind for billions of years. And if you have any uh, terrain or rock that is soft enough, then the wind can actually pick up sand and other things and carve these um, materials uh, into these kind of long striated um, ridges. How do these ridges communicate with each other so that they know about each other, I guess much in the same way that dunes do, right? These are self-organized landforms and there's something about the, the wind communication that helps them understand each other. So we have a, a grant from NASA right now to study some yardangs. Um, these are found um, on Earth in a number of places and this is in the Puna of Argentina. Looking at some volcanic ash, you can see a few of the individual beds here. This is 70,000 year old, 70,000 year old caldera ash. It's a really a amazing landscape, very young, um, just the oldest is something like 10 million years old of the volcanic eruptions up here. So um, you see some volcanic ash here, you see gravels, and each of these are carved into um, these individual kind of little towers. There are also some miniature wind indicators. The lithics in ash are acting as um, little strong pieces out ahead of the softer ash. And so as the wind blows, it extends out into what's called dados. You know what dados are? Fingers, right? So there's these little fingers that point out and uh, they're eroded back. So we actually measured a whole bunch of dados across a, a sample yardang to try to build up a picture to help us make a wind model. And this is not quite our model, but it's, a, it's the same idea. We're looking at how wind is blowing across the yardangs. And then um, my other student, Dylan, is looking at um, the rock characteristics. How hard is it? What's the hardness? What is the composition, uh, the pumice um, percentage, and all kinds of things to understand how these things are forming. Let's skip this one. Um, and so we're, we're kind of starting to understand this. And a picture is emerging of how they form. And what I also find at yardang fields is, is a pervasive layer of gravels. And these are gravel ripples. Like, are they ripples of gravel? Does the gravel saltate? There's no way the gravel can saltate, right? 
We even were in a pretty big windstorm and I was watching really closely. Is that gravel moving? And no, the gravel wasn't moving. Um, so I think they probably just move by reptation, right? Slow impacts by sand and they slowly move across the landscape. But there's something about the gravels that helps in the formation of the yardings and we're starting to build up a picture that starts with this kind of landscape, just sort of ridged, rippled landscape. I'm very proud of myself because I'm flying my drone and walking. <laughs> Managed to make that work. And, um, and then, we, can you see a few towers starting to poke up? So these are incipient yardangs in this gently ridged landscape. And I see really similar things in Antarctica, um, in Sastrugi and other things. And so, uh, so, you know, here we are, these are some in China, and we might imagine ourselves just like uh, on Titan. <laughs> little astronauts on Titan. Um, so we probably should end. I'm going to just do a couple of quick other things here because I haven't talked much about Dragonfly, uh, but I want to get to just a little bit. Um, so one thing about Titan is that we've got all of these things sitting here on the surface of Titan. We've got energy, we've got organic materials, there are two liquids, there's water probably if there are impact craters and there's methane. Methane can even be the liquid that we need to be involved in biological processes if we have to use it, if water's not available. So there's these two options for life having evolved on Titan. And of course we can't say we're going to look for life because you know this, you're most likely going to fail <laughs> at that. Uh, but we'll, we'll just look at the, the chemistry and see what's going on. And so we do have this this um, spacecraft, it's really going to be pretty good. There's this um, better atmosphere to function in, a lower gravity. This is a really big aircraft. So there are, you can see there are um, eight, uh, four sets of, of two blades, okay? And this is a half of one. So this is really big. It's as tall as I am. It's a couple times wider. It's a spacecraft, right? And uh, it will fly directly there. And um, just a little bit on the instruments. I'm sorry to skip around here. But um, we've got a mass spectrometer. We've got this drill to be able to suck the materials up into the mass spectrometer. A gamma ray and neutron spectrometer to remotely sense the materials in front of us. Um, look at, you know, like the atmospheric pressure and things like that. There's a little seismometer that will lower down and land on the surface and then retract it back up to listen for Titan quakes. And then there's a camera, a set of cameras that will be uh, really good. And the cameras will help us Here's a little bit about the uh, mass spectrometer. We actually will get actual samples. I'm so excited about that. Um, and, and then eventually, what about this? Get the one thing that I really want, which is my handful of sand. Um, get that right here. Here's my handful of sand. This is some glass sand from <laughs> Kauai. There's a glass sand beach. Like everybody should go to this because it's, there's a trash heap right around the corner. So you should always look at your geology. Um, so all these cameras will say, oh, we can see sand dunes and we can see close up and we can even do this microscopic imaging, these are pictures from Mars, actual pictures that we have. And we want to get the same thing on Titan because in my opinion, sand really tells you about uh, all the landscape around. There's kind of the end result of a lot of processes that have led to this handful of sand. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you very much.